Jesus, what a friend for sinners, Jesus, lover of my soul. Friends, Welcome to the Unknown Bible, the broadcast ministry of Bible Believers Baptist Church in Corpus Christi, Texas. Join us now for today's Bible study with our pastor, Bevan Zwelder. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, we read this. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now we know, we know that the devil is a roaring lion. You know that from what you've read in the Bible, and you know that from what you've experienced in your own life. He is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, what the devil does, according to the scripture, is that he patiently waits for optimum times to attack. I mean, because he's like a lion. Lions aren't just attacking relentlessly all day and all night. Uh, they, they wait until the advantage is in their favor. They're stealthy uh, and they're wise. And and we know from reading Daniel that the devil is wiser than Daniel. So he patiently waits for optimum times to attack. Now, what we're going to discuss today are some of the more obvious times when you can expect the devil to bring an attack. And let's get right into it. Attacks from the devil come, first of all, right after you're born again, right after you're born again. Now to see this, let's go to Exodus chapter 1, verse 22. Exodus chapter 1, verse 22. In Exodus chapter 1, what's happened here is that Israel, the Jews, are growing in number, and Pharaoh is taking precautions against their growth because he doesn't want them to join with an enemy at some point in the future and attack or support an enemy that is attacking him. And so he decides that the thing to do is to kill all the baby boys that are born. Now he tries to get the midwives to do that, but they won't. And so in verse 22, Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. So he was attacking he was killing those baby boys to reduce the population of Jews. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, we see a similar thing. And this was accomplished by Herod after Herod was informed of the birth of Jesus Christ. Uh, he was mad when he found out that the magicians, or not the magicians, but the wise men, uh, had left and had not come back to tell him where Jesus was in Bethlehem. So what did Herod do? Herod, in Matthew 2.16, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coast thereof from two years old and under according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Well, he was trying, what he was trying to do is he was trying to kill Jesus Christ, and since he didn't know who he was, he figured if he killed all the babies, then he would get Jesus as well. Now, both of these are instances where a king, who is a type of antichrist, was killing babies. And what, and what the, the drowning of the boys by Pharaoh and the killing of the children by Herod, what, what these picture are attacks by the devil on newborn babes in Christ. You see, at, right after a child of God is born, the devil will attack. And these attacks are generally manifested as, well, probably more, more than likely one of three things. First would be interference by religious wolves. Uh, look in Acts chapter 20. Paul warned against this uh, when he was talking to the elders of Ephesus about what would happen when he left and, and went on down to Jerusalem. 
Look in Acts chapter 20 and talking to these elders at Ephesus. Paul says in verse 29, I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Well, those, those religious wolves, those grievous wolves are like the Pharisees were. And uh, you, today you're going to see them like Mormons. You're going to see them like Jehovah's Witnesses. You're going to see them like uh, perhaps Catholics. Maybe somebody has been saved that was in the Catholic Church, and suddenly uh, the family, maybe the priest, uh, others that are you know dedicated to the religion will come back and say, no, 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 you need to come back here. And and what these religions will do, it, it's amazing. It's 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 got to be by the devil. They just seem to know when and where to show up. They're like vultures in the tree. And as soon as this newborn lamb is 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 on the ground, boom! They're they're swooping down to gobble them up in their religions. And once that happens. Uh, that poor little lamb is going to be messed up if they don't. If that lamb doesn't get into the Bible, and get under some good teaching, and grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, another manifestation of an attack by the devil, right after somebody gets saved, is the deceptive wooing by pastors who corrupt the Word of God. Look in Acts chapter twenty, verse thirty. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to, to draw away disciples after them. Uh, there are a lot of immature young Christians. They've just been born again. They're not, they're not, they haven't grown. They're not going to grow now. And they have been scooped up into churches, uh, like some man said, that are a mile wide and an inch deep. And they've been deceived into now believing that what they feel and what they experience is uh, are manifestations of the Spirit of God. And oftentimes they're not. They're manifestations of, of evil spirits. Paul said, we're not as many which corrupt the Word of God. He said that in 2 Corinthians 2.17. And man, there's a lot of that going on today. Uh, another manifestation of an attack by the devil right after you're born again or right after somebody's born again is the introduction of false doctrine. Uh, all of these are closely um, aligned with each other. But look in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, the Bible says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. See, children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Uh, these are men that are interested in getting up their own following. A lot of times they are planted in churches and then these new people get saved and whoosh, they're there to start introducing them to their doctrine which um, oftentimes is false, and they start drawing these people away after themselves. So that's one. Uh, one time when the devil attacks would be right after a person is born again. But another time you can expect an attack from the devil is right after, right after a spiritual blessing. Uh, let's go back to the book of Exodus again. See, we're seeing some of these things in type, but we know they're true because we've seen them. In Exodus chapter 16, Exodus chapter 17, here's what's going on. Amalek, in Exodus 17, 8, attacked the Jews, Israel, right after God had delivered them from Pharaoh. Uh, they had gone to the Red Sea. They were scared. God opened up the Red Sea and allowed the Jews to get across on dry land. Pharaoh and his men went in afterwards. God closed the Red Sea and drowned them. Great blessing, great victory. They came out on the other side and the people began to murmur because they didn't have anything to eat. And God gave them, miraculously gave them manna from heaven. That's Exodus 16. And then, after they are miraculously provided with manna from heaven, they don't have anything to drink. In Exodus chapter 17, in the first seven verses, God miraculously provides them with water out of a rock. And then, as soon as they have 
the water, they have the bread, and they have the victory over Pharaoh. Boom. Verse 8 of Exodus chapter 17. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Boom. You see, the attack of Amalek right after the deliverance from Pharaoh, the provision of the manna, and the provision of water out of the rock is an example of how the devil will come after you right after you've experienced a spiritual blessing because you're still high on the blessing. You're still wanting to enjoy the mountaintop. But if you've been saved a while, you know that the Christian life goes from mountaintop to valley and back again. It's the way it is. And that's why God gave us the whole armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the loins girt about with the truth, the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, uh, the shield of faith, and, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And then those legs, those knees, uh, which are there for prayer. Seven pieces, the prayer in addition to those six pieces of armor. You know why we have that? Because you're always in the battle. That's right. Even, even when you've gone through a, a great provision by God, a, a great spiritual blessing, a great spiritual high, if you will, you're still in the battle. You see, there, just, there are moments of reprieve, and there are moments of battle victories. But there's always an adversary and there will always be attacks and he catches you at a moment when you are, you know, you're just like, whoa, it's so good. And then bam, and you're like, what just happened to me? And it's the shock of that attack following that spiritual blessing that causes you to want to retreat from the blessing so that you don't get the attacks. And that's what the devil's trying to do. He's trying to destroy your joy He's trying to let you know that you, that, you, that you are not going to enjoy this Christian life. Now, it's not true that we don't rejoice because Paul said rejoice evermore. And Jesus Christ said, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Uh, don't be discouraged by the fact that there are attacks that come. Just keep going forward. Uh, look at Exodus chapter 14. H here you're seeing the Jews and they're stuck at the Red Sea. And Pharaoh is right on their tail, and they're trapped. They're, they are, they're hemmed up, man. They are entangled in the land, according to Exodus 14, 3. And, and then what does Moses tell them in Exodus 14, 14? The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Now watch it. This is a fabulous verse of Scripture here, verse 15, Exodus 14, 15. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel, watch it, that they go forward. <laughs> I love that verse of Scripture. Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. Keep going forward, just like the Jews did after they left Egypt and, and then came to the Red Sea. Just don't stop. I've had to say to a couple of people recently, uh, friends of mine who are, who are, gaining ground in their spiritual lives and then they've been you know they had these these bang these these battles i've told them this don't give up the ground you've won don't give it up it was a hard fought battle to get on the ground you're on don't go backwards keep going forward just like the jews did after they left egypt and came to that red sea so attacks by the devil come right after you're born again now, if you're recently saved and all of a sudden you're you know, feeling that attack, hey, phew, everybody goes through that. Just don't worry about it. Um, get into the Bible. Get under good preaching. Get in a good Bible-believing church and start getting some good sound doctrine in you. Attacks come right after a spiritual blessing. And if you've had a good spiritual blessing, you can look for a spiritual attack. It's going to come. If you're in the midst of a valley right now, just keep going. There is another mountain not far away. All right? Here's another time when attacks come. They come during emotionally trying times. Attacks come during emotionally trying times. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, we're having a discussion about husbands and wives in, in this chapter. 
And uh, what's happened is there's an explanation that Eve was the one who was deceived. Adam was not deceived. But then, but then, speaking in the marriage, uh, Paul prepares husbands and wives for those times when they are open to attack, particularly in times like childbearing. Look at First Timothy chapter two, verses fourteen and fifteen. Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, that is, saved from deception, in childbearing, if they, that is, the husband and wife, continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. You see, childbearing is an emotionally trying time for parents. It's particularly trying for the wife, but also for the husband, because there are so many changes in the relationship. So therefore, parents in First Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, are instructed to continue in faith, continue in charity, continue in holiness, continue in holiness with sobriety. Those four things, still trusting God, still loving each other, still staying away from sin, and sober-mindedly approaching life. Because during emotionally trying times, you've got to continue in the things that keep you stable. That's right, you have to continue the things that keep you rooted and grounded and strong. See, those emotionally trying times are naturally times of weakness. And... And stability is in, you know, your prayer life and your relationship with God when you're rooted and grounded in good doctrine and you're strengthened in the fellowship of your church. You know, if you don't get into a time like that, you know what happens? You could easily become prey for the devil. L listen, in First Peter chapter 5, which is where we started in verse 8, look at verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Then he says, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. See, you're rooted and grounded in faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. He says you've got to know that you're going to go through this. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. So when you get into those emotional tying times, that's not a time to start having a fight with your wife or a fight with your husband or start to sin. That's when you really want to stay strong in faith, resist steadfast in the faith, stay strong in that love for each other, strong in that holiness with God, and be sober, be vigilant. That's when the attacks come. All right, attacks come from the devil also during periods of exhaustion. First Kings chapter 19, First Kings chapter 19, during periods of exhaustion. All right, in First Kings chapter 19, we're reading about Elijah. And what's happened? Well, in first seven, chapter 17, he shows up, and he has the collision with Ahab, 18. He has the collision with the Baal worshipers, the priests of Baal, the prophets of Baal, the prophets of Jezebel, and proves by fire that God is the Lord, not Baal. And then in 1 Kings chapter 19, uh, Jezebel sends word that she's going to kill Elijah. But by this time, he is exhausted. He was exhausted after his showdown with the priest of Baal at Carmel, and he was exhausted uh, after First Kings 1840, when he killed the 450 prophets of Baal, he was exhausted at the end of First Kings uh, chapter 18 after running in front of Ahab's chariot all the way from Carmel to Jezreel. Boy, I'm, and when he gets to Jezreel, he is he is absolutely exhausted with all that he has had to do for the Lord in the ministry, and that's when Jezebel says. Um, so let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them, speaking of the prophets, by tomorrow about this time. She said, I'm going to kill you. And, and listen, Elijah knew that Jezebel was a very, very wicked queen. So what, what happened to Elijah? Well, he, he, he went a day's journey in verse 4, 1 Kings 19.4. Into the wilderness, came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. 
and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. He was so discouraged and so exhausted, he was ready to die. I mean, suicidal thoughts. Have you read Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11? Jesus Christ, right, is, has been fasting 40 days and 40 nights. Who shows up? The devil. What does he do? He tempts him with three different temptations. The devil attacked Jesus Christ. And this thing going on with Elijah, Jezebel typ typifies an attack by the devil. And the same thing, caught, listen, caught him when he was exhausted, when he was out of gas. When you are overwhelmed with all that comes from your, you know, your way in life, that's the time you want to be aware of an attack. Yeah, I mean, you've had hard days at the office, tough times at home. Uh, you haven't been in your Bible. You haven't been praying. You're worn out, literally, and you know you're worn out. And what you've been doing in this period of being worn out is you have taken more upon you because that's our natural thing. We take more upon us because we think the thing that's killing us is that we have too much to do. So if I do more now, I won't have all these things here trying to kill me. And that's exactly what the devil wants you to do. It'll load yourself up and get away from God so he can bust you. Don't do that. Beware of an attack. The best thing to do is to stop. That's right. Just cancel that appointment. Say, I don't need to be there. I need to do it, but I don't need to do it today. Cancel that appointment. Uh, cut out that list of things that you have that you're trying to get out of the way and rest. And during that period of rest, draw very close to the Lord. Get your Bible. You know, get a, a, a Bible app. I prefer Scory so you can listen to it because you can't even concentrate on two verses, one right after the other, without being distracted by everything that has exhausted you. Just start listening until your mind gets clear and your heart gets close to Jesus. Put on your walking shoes, go outside, get some fresh air, and talk to God until you are spiritually strong and restored. Don't pile on more to do. Don't do that. Get strong because you know that the devil's going to come after you when you're exhausted and you can't let yourself get there. Or if you're there, you can't stay there. All right, here's another one. Uh, attacks come during occasions of disobedience. Second Corinthians chapter 2. Second Corinthians chapter 2. And look at verse 10. Uh, Paul is writing to the Corinthians about that young man that was committing fornication with his father's wife in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He's gotten it straightened out, so now he's telling, now Paul is telling the congregation to forgive him. And he says in 2 Corinthians 2.10, To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Why? Verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. That's what Paul said. We're not ignorant of his devices. Paul knew that the devil could hurt the Corinthians if they didn't forgive that fellow who messed up. Now, we're given specific commands in the Bible about things like getting rid of the root of bitterness, getting bitterness and anger and clamor and evil speaking out of your life, you know, uh, humbling yourself instead of going in pride. You know, we're given very specific commands in the Bible about these kind of things, and you've got to obey them. Why? Because failure to obey leaves an opening for the devil. That's right. Now, you have to be careful. There's a caveat here. Attacks are not to be confused with trials which God sends you to prove you. I mean, if you think back to Exodus 14, 15, 16, where we were talking about the, the attack of Amalek, you got to remember that when Israel ran out of water, they were facing bitter water. The Lord said, I, I brought that to you for one reason. I wanted to prove you to see if you'd walk in my commandments. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 says that Jesus learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Those are not attacks by the devil. Those are, those are areas of proving ground where the, where the Lord tests you and tests me to see if we will obey him. They, they're, really, they're really there to strengthen you, but they can also throw you off if you fail the test. The Lord will prove you to see if you're going to obey him or if you're going to follow another person instead. Okay, I'm thinking of a, a situation right now where a young man has followed his girlfriend instead of following the Lord. 
And I will tell you this, if you, so he proved that he was not willing to obey the Lord in that matter. Now, if you, listen, if you don't pass the test and you decide that you're going to then disobey God, you set yourself up. And you set yourself up for the last category or the last area where you got to really be careful about a, an attack from the devil, and that's during times of separation. During times of separation. You see, God is going to try to prove you, but you, you know how those Jews, they turn their back on God, and boy, I mean, the devil got them. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5, we are told in marriage to, to not defraud each other, except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency, the inability to withhold uh, when you have been apart from your wife for a period of time. So in a marriage, a husband and wife are not to be separated for too long because of the potential for Satan to tempt them. Well, this is not only true in marriage, but also in church. When you are separate from the flock, you are open to attack. There you go. Oh, yeah, you know, you see, you let this and that kind of deer season or, or your or your favorite uh, recreational activities keep you out of church for a while, or you get disgruntled, you get discouraged, whatever the case may be. When you are separated from the flock, you are very, very, very open to an attack by the devil. Why? Because if you think about lions, they don't go right into the middle of the herd. Oftentimes they're looking for... You know, a, a newborn, right? Or that lion is come looking for something that's been weakened and separated from the rest of the herd because the herd's not there to protect it. And they can isolate that one sick animal and take it down and kill it. You don't let yourself get in that situation. So when you, when you know these instances that we've talked about today are, are instances where Satan may attack, then you can be particularly vigilant during these times, like right after a person's born again. If you've got somebody you led to the Lord, be right there for them to disciple them and care for them. Don't let the cults get them. Right after a spiritual blessing in your own life, during an emotionally trying time, during periods of exhaustion, during occasions of disobedience, and during times of separation, don't let yourself get separated. You never want to be unguarded. But you definitely want to be on guard when you go through one of these events. Now, Leaving yourself unprotected can be devastating, so don't do that. Learn from what you've heard in the Bible today, and may God bless you when you do. Amen. You have been listening to The Unknown Bible, the radio ministry of Bible Believers Baptist Church in Corpus Christi, Texas. For information about our church, go to our church website at www.my3bc.com. That's my, the number three, bc.com. If you would like to contact us by telephone, our number is 361-241-6100. Bible Believers Baptist Church is a Bible-believing church located at 1701 Rand Morgan Road. If you are not currently a member of a Bible-believing church and you are looking for a church with an uncompromising stand on the words of God, come visit with us this Sunday or Wednesday. We would love to see you. Hallelujah.